Hello everyone, my name is Varun Vora and I'm an associate professor at the University of Electrocommunications in Japan. But obviously, as you can see from my face, I'm not Japanese, I'm, I'm actually French. But anyways, um, I would like to thank the, um, the organizers for inviting me to give this talk today, despite the coronavirus situation. And today I will be talking about uh, organic soil cells and a sustainable methods to fabricate these organic soil cells. But before we start, we should talk about a global issue, the global energy issue and the importance of solar energy. Uh, as you can see from the map here, uh, solar radiation is, is present everywhere on a, on a global uh, scale. And uh, in particular, it's very abundant in uh, sub-Saharan countries, for example, or other low-income countries. So uh, if we take uh, the example of Ethiopia, which is located here, uh, you can see that uh, with the annual solar radiation, you could easily cover the energy demand per capita. Actually, you would need just a one square meter solar cell with a five percent power conversion efficiency to cover this energy demand. And this makes us wonder why don't uh, low income countries harvest more solar energy to, uh, to cover their, their energy demand. And um, there are a couple of reasons, but uh, the most obvious one is that conventional so, uh, solar photovoltaic technology is quite expensive. So the, the, co the common solar panels that you can see everywhere on rooftops or, or anywhere um, around any city in the world are made uh, with silicon technology. This means that you actually have to um, fabricate your panels through very costly uh, material, using very costly materials, but also um, processing them at very high temperatures. So typically over 1,400 degrees. Uh, so it has a high cost and a high carbon footprint. And of course you have to, to do additional um, advanced processes here. Um, the other problem is that it's usually these, these kind of solar cells are rejected by local communities because uh, they disturb the natural sceneries. They're not really in harmony with local architecture. So in particular, for example, in historical places, cultural places, um, they will disturb the view, basically. And the other thing is that they're heavy and uh, not really easy to install. So in, in addition to the cost, there are other things that are uh, hindering these kind of, of um, silicon based photovoltaic technologies. And a lot of people end up being like this, that it's too costly and too ugly for them. So uh, is there a, um, a technology that is more suitable for these low income countries and in general for, for everyone? Yes, there is. And this is what we will be talking about today, the um, organic solar cells that are based mainly on conjugated polymers. So the active layer is you're basically replacing silicon based active layers with um, organic semiconductors. And one of the organic semiconductors conventionally is, is, um, is a conjugated polymer. So because of this, you enable low cost and low temperature process uh, because of the filmability of uh, these, uh, these polymers, you can use something like spin coating. So using spin coating, you can actually achieve um, record power conversion efficiencies around 18% now. So this used to be around 10% uh, five years ago, five, six years ago. Um, it, it's growing very quickly and um, actually scarily quickly. So we're, we can expect um, these efficiencies to be similar to silicon-based photovoltaic technology within maybe a um, couple of years or, or five years. So uh, the interesting part is that you can actually fabricate your devices using something like inject printing. So you, you can even think about fabricating your own um, solar cells at home or through, uh, for example, painting like you would paint your car or actually printing like your journals or, or anything that, that is a uh, high productivity um, roll to roll process, basically. The other thing is that because of their uh, semi-transparent nature and lightweight, um, they can actually be in harmony with cities and with nature. So for example, you can think about these kind of futuristic applications where you have a, a fully uh, solar powered uh, sports car. So this is a concept car by Nissan, by the way. Uh, so you, they, it's using solar windshield. So everything here is is a solar cell. Uh, you can think about solar trees that you can basically blend uh, within nature or within any urban environment. And uh, solar windows. Uh, this is a paper that we published a couple of years back, where you can see that um, you basically see the same thing as a normal window, slightly darker, but you can generate power from from your window basically. So how do these organic soil cells work? 
uh, the, the working principle is actually quite straightforward. Uh, you need two materials in your active layer, one electron donor, which is usually the conjugated polymer, and an electron acceptor, which can be either a fullerene derivative or a non-fullerene derivative. Uh, what happens, so I'm giving the example actually of uh, what happens when the electron donor absorbs light. So you have light absorption, which generates an exciton, so a Fresnel exciton, that, um, a Fresnel exciton, sorry, that will uh, diffuse to a donor acceptor interface. And at the donor acceptor interface, because of the difference in LUMO of the two materials, the promoted electron will basically transfer to the LUMO of the acceptor. And that will be uh, how you generate your electron on the, the acceptor and your whole on the donor. So that's what I represented here um, with these colors here. So this is the electron, uh, one additional charge, and this is the, um, the hole where you have um, le one less electron, let's say. Uh, then these charges have to be transported to their respective electrodes, and that's how you generate the photocurrent. Now, um, I won't go into details, but um, you have to keep in mind a couple of things that uh, the JSC, basically the short circuit current density, is related to the amount of interface that you have, donor acceptor interface that you have in your device. Um, but also the crystallinity of these uh, materials will play an essential role in terms of uh, charge collection. So uh, crystallinity will increase the field factor of your devices. And of course, one of the major parameters that people look into is the power conversion efficiency. I was talking about this before. Um, but anyways, the, these, um, these devices are, are great in, in principle, but they have one major sustainability sustainability issue. And I will talk about this now. So the problem comes from the fact that uh, even though they can be solution processed, the solvent that is used for um, depositing these kind of, of active layers are, are usually very bad. So it's chlorobenzene or dichlorobenzene, which um, as you may know, they, they are actually very toxic. So um, they, they result in air or water contamination or, or diseases basically. And the other issue is that the the conventional way that uh, people deposit the active layer to obtain high quality and high efficiency devices is by spin coating. So what happens when you spin coat is that through centrifugal forces, sorry, you um, you basically elongate your your uh, your solution and uh, you fabricate wet films, and then from there, within seconds, you can fabricate dry films. Uh, the issue is that when you do this, you actually eject ninety percent of your solution. Um, through these centrifugal forces. And these 90% um, contain high cost uh, materials, so relatively high cost materials, and also these toxic solvents. So we want to reduce these kind of wastes. And to do this, what we looked into is a technique called push coating. Uh, this was developed in 2012 for uh, one of the most common conjugated polymer. Um, everyone might be familiar with this name, P3HT. Um, the, the, working principle of, of this technique is very straightforward as well. What you do is you use a silicon elastomer made with uh, PDMS, so polydimethyl siloxane, that you placed on a very small amount of um, solution, so active layer solution or, or any other uh, organic semiconductor solution, uh, which is basically 20 times less than what you would use for spin coating. And uh, when you put this elastomer here on top of this through, um, through basically capillary forces, you will elongate the solution between the substrate and uh, the PDMS stamp. And then uh, the solvent will diffuse inside PDMS and you will be able to generate a very high quality film. Now, uh, when you do this, because you fabricate your film just uh, until the, uh, the edge of the PDMS, so it's, it's due to the capillary forces, it's a very sustainable fabrication method because you have no active material waste. The other thing is that this, the toxic solvent is temporarily trapped inside PDMS, so it can be very easily recycled. So it's good for nature, it's good for your health, and it's also good for your wallet. Now, um, what happens when we try to compare the performance of uh, devices made by push coating with devices made by spin coating? Uh, the first actually trials were mostly for um, organic field effect transistors uh, using P3HD. And what you can see is that compared to spin coating, uh, when you look at push coated films, you can see a much higher crystalline order in uh, push coated films compared to spin coated films. So in the case of P3HD, this led to very high whole mobility values of 0 0.47 centimeter square per volt seconds, which is one order of uh, magnitude higher than what you get for uh, spin coated films. 
we also more recently tried to make uh, organic light emitting devices using, for example, F8BT or MEHPPV um, as an uh, emitting layer. And in these devices, we also saw that the efficiency, so the external quantum efficiency, is enhanced with respect to spin coating. So this is great for this uh, single material layer, but in the case of uh, organic soil cell active layer, you're actually blending two different materials and the drying dynamics of spin coating and push coating are very different. So we were wondering if it's also possible to do the same thing with organic soil cell active layers. And we first checked this with the, uh, say, the, the state of the art. Uh, materials for organic soil cells, P3HT and PC61BM. So these used to be um, very often employed until 2012. Uh, now it's getting a bit more rare, but they're still considered um, the best materials to study I'd say, the, the uh, fundamentals of, of organic soil cells. Uh, in this case, we compared spin coating where you need a post annealing to increase the crystallinity of P3HT uh, with push coating where no post annealing is, is necessary. And as you can see here, so comparing spin coating and push coating using two different solvents, so chlorobenzene or dichlorobenzene, we get very similar power conversion efficiencies. And one thing that you can clearly see here is that um, the push coated films actually generate much higher fill factors compared to spin coated films despite being annealed. So uh, this is related again to higher crystallinity in, um, in your active layers, which basically promotes your charge transport and charge collection. And because of this, you can, um, you can have very high um, charge collection efficiency. Now we can also see a slight decrease in GSC, which is most probably due to a uh, larger phase separation because uh, you're giving more time to the films to form due to the, the slower drying uh, dynamics, basically. And because of this, uh, you might generate this kind of detrimental phase separation and slight decrease in, in uh, GSC. Now, what we thought is, can we avoid this detrimental phase separation by using a more amorphous system? So we moved to uh, another system composed of PCDTBT, which is a, an amorphous um, conjugated polymer, so a copolymer actually, and um, PC71BM, which is a, a fullerene derivative that absorbs visible light. And what we can see here is that uh, despite being more amorphous, uh, if you compare to annealed spin coated films, you actually see the formation of, of aggregates in the films of uh, PCDTPT, PC71BM. Here, uh, I didn't write it, but the ratio is four to one, four PC71BM to one PCDTPT. So most probably these aggregates that we see on the surface are PC71BM aggregates. Uh, despite this, we still get similar power conversion efficiencies for um, spin coated films, annealed spin coated films, and um, push coated films processed at room temperature. So now this is, um, this is quite a nice result um, because it shows us that we can get similar or higher performance um, compared to spin coated with push coating, pu push coating. But as I was talking about in my introduction, actually spin coating is not the only process that you can use to manufacture your uh, solar cells and most probably um, other processes will be used for when it comes to commercial fabrication. So uh, we try to compare basically push coating with other um, probably commercial uh, processes like future commercial processes like blade coating, which is represented here, or uh, spraying, which is represented here. So uh, if you look at this, um, this table here, you can first of all see that uh, the only process that has similar power conversion efficiencies to spin coated films is uh, push coated. Now, the second thing I want to draw your attention to is that in terms of volume of toxic solvent that you use, uh, push coated actually has the lowest volume of all these processes. What comes next, the second in line is uh, blade coated. And actually in this case, even though um, in terms of, um, of volume of toxic solvent, it doesn't seem to be so bad. Uh, blade coating still, blade coated thing, sorry, still uses uh, twice as much as, um, uh, of um, toxic solvent as push coated films. And also in terms of power conversion efficient, efficiency, blade coated you, films usually generate lower power conversion efficiencies compared to push coated ones. So uh, these are great results and it works really well for conjugated polymers associated with fullerenes. 
But uh, for those who are familiar with organic soil cells, they know that to get, for example, power conversion efficiencies over 10%, we have to move towards non fluorine active layers. And uh, we did some initial tests there uh, with one of the new reference in the field of organic soil cells, so PBDBT ITIC. Um, active layers. Um, again, the, in these molecules are represented here. These are very crystalline molecules. And usually one of the requirements to achieve high power conversion efficiencies over 8.5% is that you can um, actually crystallize both materials at the same time. And what we tried to do here is to compare uh, the, the um, the pre-coated and, and uh, spin-coated films fabricated from chlorobenzene with a solvent additive called t yodo octan uh, This is actually um, a solvent additive that promotes um, crystallinity. And what we saw here, and it's more obvious in the out-of-plane uh, results, is that ITIC actually over-aggregates in the pre-coated films, uh, whereas in the spin-coated films, you can clearly see that PBDBT uh, crystals are present and uh, also IT crystals are present. So this over aggregation of IT here actually hinders the, um, the formation of crystalline domains of PVDBT. And uh, because of this, you see a large decrease in, in both JSC and field factor in the devices that are push coated compared to spin coated ones. We still get a power con average power conversion efficiency around 5.8%, but compared to the average for spin coated films of 8.8%, uh, that's still very low. And we're actually working on um, methods to improve uh, th these kind of, of uh, parameters here, and in particular to avoid over aggregation. And one thing that we noticed very recently is that diodo octane actually doesn't diffuse very nicely into PDMS. So one way to go might be to replace this solvent additive with something else or to simply change the, the solvent uh, to dichlorobenzene, for example. Another thing that we noticed as well is that we could include fullerene acceptors, a small amount of fullerene acceptors inside these films to avoid over aggregation here. Anyways, these are ongoing work, and I hope I will have more to present next time at, at the conference. Uh, but anyways, let me try to summarize what I said today. So push coating is a green and sustainable conjugated polymer thin field fabrication technique. Uh, you use 20 times less toxic solvent than um, for uh, spin coating. Uh, so, and the solvent is trapped in PDMS, so you can actually recycle it very easily. Um, there's no material waste, so it, it becomes ultra low cost, absolutely no material waste. And it's 40 times less costly to make the active layer compared to spin coating. Now, we were able to successfully apply this to system based on P3HTPC, DTBT, and uh, fullerene organic soil cells. Um, and they, they basically show the same photovoltaic performance as uh, spin coating. And, and we could obtain with PCDTBT power conversion efficiencies around 5.8%, uh, which would be, for example, sufficient to um, cover the energy demand for Ethiopia, like I was saying in the introduction. Now, we still need to optimize a little bit more to get uh, power conversion efficiencies over 10%. And in particular, we have to look into the drying dynamics of our films and most probably change the solvent of, um, that we use during fabrication and maybe add a small amount of less crystalline materials like PC71BM. Now, um, I presented mostly our work on organic soil cells that are push coated, but push coating, push coating sorry, could basically be applied to any um, polymer film that uses solvents that diffuse inside PDMS. So um, there are many possible applications and I hope that actually the use of push coating will be spread to other applications in the future. I would like to briefly thank a couple of people, my lab students uh, back at home, um, international collaborators that are listed here from uh, Romania, it Italy, and also, sorry, Romania, Italy, and also from other, other collaborators from Japan, collaborators also within the universities, which are essential, and of course, um, the uh, financial support without which we wouldn't have been able to, to, um, to have to be able to make these experiments and, and have these nice results. Finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, comments, or even if you have any ideas for potential collaborations, please feel free to uh, send me an email here. Um, again, thank you for your attention.